why will you buy from a 10% startup company? You gotta be crazy. It probably cost me, I think, uh, $50 million. Then I said, how will I find people? They said, no, no, people find you. They follow you. People usually think that entrepreneurship means starting a company. No. Every time you raise a confusion, what entrepreneurs should do, ask yourself what happens in dating. 100% of the time is the same answer. And recently, he was fired. If you don't do any of the above, you deserve to be fired. Hi guys, today we are having a very special guest in our program. He came from United States, from California, Silicon Valley, and this is uh, Naeem Zafar. Uh, Naeem is a founding CEO of Telesense company, this is AOT company, technology company in Silicon Valley. And uh, what's interesting about him also that he before worked uh, or started uh, seven companies, seven technological companies in Silicon Valley and one of the companies was sold uh, to Oracle five years ago. Uh, also what's interesting about him, he is a professor in University of California, Berkeley, so he teaches the technology, the strategy, startups, entrepreneurship, and what's more interesting that he is uh, the author of six books of uh, different aspects of uh, entrepreneurship. So uh, today he is with us to share his insights uh, on, on this aspect. Let's get started. From your level of understanding, from, from your level of expertise, um, uh, what would you recommend the founders and companies to stay competitive uh, in, the, in the marketplace? Well, the most important thing is to understand the customer's unmet need. Every startup exists to address a need or a pain which somebody has. If you have no pain, why will you buy from a 10% startup company? You gotta be crazy. So you have some unmet need which is not being met by current solution. So give me an example of any company and I'll tell you there was an unmet need. Let's even take Twitter because people said there was no need for Twitter. And the fact is, there was a need. People wanted to self-publish. They wanted to say something meaningful so others can hear. So when somebody told me, I mean, yeah, you can write a blog, but how do you find people to read your blog? And then you have to make sure it's written properly, your language is correct. So when somebody told me, you can just only have to write 140 characters, and your grammar does not even have to be correct, I was like, yeah, I like that. Then I said, how will I find people? They said, no, no, people find you. They follow you. I said, that sounds pretty good. How much does it cost? No, it's free. Well, sign me up. So this is the point. There was a need to self-expression, to self-publishing, and Twitter was there to fill it. So every company is there to fulfill some unmet need. The job of the entrepreneur is identify it, validate it, and then figure out what is the right solution to fill that need. So that's the advice I give to everybody. Focus on the customer focus on the need, and focus on the user, because user may not be the customer. Mm -hmm. If you have a toy or some game, user may be the child, but the customer may be mom. If you're selling something into hospitals, the doctor may be the user, but doctor is certainly not the buyer, so he's not the customer. So you have to differentiate, understand who's your user, who's your customer, what, is, what satisfies them, what is the unmet need, and then you design a solution. Mm -hmm. So if you follow that advice, you can avoid half the mistakes people make. But uh, say, say uh, what practically, uh, should it be a strategic session or how, for example, people who want to do the product, uh, how, how to find your niche or you know, this unmet need, you know, how, how it can be done practically? By listening, by reading, <coughs> by observing. So that's why most entrepreneurs come out of a working in some industry when they observe the need, figure out what's not happening well, being frustrated that nobody's doing it, and some of those people then say, maybe I should do it. 
Right. I remember Richard Branson said that he started his Virgin Airlines because he was flying a couple of times and he was so unhappy with the, with the situation and then he came home and then this idea just, just came up to, to make an airline. Yeah, exactly. And, and, uh, and, and he did it. Zuckerberg also, you know, he started Facebook because he had a personal need to have a better understanding who are his class fellows at Harvard. What do they like? Because they normally used to give you a little a pay, Facebook, they used to call it but just the faces and a name and which high school you went to. Well, that's not enough information. So you want to know what music they like, what's their phone number, and what else happening. So there was a bit of a personal need behind Facebook, how it started mm -hmm. at least. There's always an unmet need. I've heard you saying about the so-called entrepreneurial mindset. Yeah. If you could uh, say uh, what you mean by that and how people can develop it. Yeah, that's an important question. People usually think that entrepreneurship means starting a company. No, that's only one manifestation when you have to start a company because starting a company is very hard. It requires a lot of dedication, a lot of resources collection, and almost an irrational desire to do something. But entrepreneurial mindset is bigger than starting a company. You could be work for the, one of the largest, most boring company and yet have entrepreneurial mindset. What I mean by that is when others see a wall on an obstacle, you see an opportunity. When others are complaining, you're thinking about how can this be improved? And that mindset is then, if you have the right mindset, you think about, okay, I don't have the money. I may not even have the power. How can I address this with minimum resources? So this is then you find other co-conspirators, other people who also may be thinking like you, maybe at the lunch cafeteria, and you slowly form a little team. So you start working together, and you address a problem, you take it to your management. So this is entrepreneurial mindset. How are you thinking, how can I get this thing done by getting other people to follow me and solve a problem by first understanding the problem? Fact is, a lot of smart people will join you if they see a purpose. Not everything is about, once you have your basic needs covered, it's not about money. Because you, you, yeah, true, you know, true. then it's, you want to do something meaningful in your, your life. So good people, smart people, the A players, is beyond money. They want to do something meaningful. They're willing to work with other A players and create something new. That's entrepreneurial mindset can exist in an oil company even in government, and I've seen that. If, uh, say, you're from Silicon Valley, and uh, we know this uh, the place where the best minds are, and um, if you could tell, um, could you name some uh, role models for you uh, out of CEOs in Silicon Valley that you think they have a great uh, entrepreneurial minds, uh, and why? So, I think, l l let's even uh, step back a second. It's not that Silicon Valley has the best minds. Best minds are everywhere, in every city. That's not the point. Uh, the point is there is a critical mass of those people in Silicon Valley. Why? Well, A, because it probably has the best weather in the world. Your temperature is between 12 degrees and 22 degrees almost all year round. And it has some of the best universities in the world. But it also because people of all shape, size, national origin are welcome if you're smart. So you, it is not uncommon in one team to have you know, three Chinese, one Israeli, one Iranian, two Indians, and one American all working together. It doesn't matter where you come from. If you're good, you are in. So, so the second point which you raised was who are some of the people we admire or emulate having the strong mind? I think that is not a fair question because it's everybody has something they're really good at. Elon Musk has some very interesting and wild ideas. It, it is almost looks impossible, but he has proven that many of them have, can come true. So we admire about his boldness. We admire like Steve Jobs' absolute focus on product and product user interface. But these great figures also have great flaws. What are these two people great managers? And the answer is uh, no. But there are other people who are great managers. They have assembled the teams. They may not be have this kind of a brilliance, but they have other brilliance. So your job, my job, my purpose is to learn from all of them. 
mm -hmm. and assimilate something which will work for my purpose. So there's, I admire dozens of people, not just one person, each for some piece what they bring. Mm -hmm. So by reading, by listening, by asking questions, all of us will accumulate a persona, a persona of what is effective. It's not about success or money, it's about effectiveness and making things happen. When, you, when you're effective, make things happen, you may be rewarded by fame or fortune, but that's really not the purpose of life. So that's, uh, that's a great advice and idea, just to have, for example, Richard Branson, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, mm -hmm. and some other guys, uh, that well-known guys, mm -hmm. and we can take uh, the best out of yeah. ev everyone. Exactly. And have this integrity. Uh, integrate all those pieces into one person, which fits your own personality. And you will, something you will do well, something you don't do well. Important thing is to know what you don't do well. For example, I'm great at able to connect the dots in real time, able to explain and answer a situation. I'm not so good at the operational detail and follow up, make sure things finish. So I know that. So I, I, I surround myself with somebody who is good at that part. So if you don't know what you're not good at, you're not willing to admit, then you will have trouble having a bulletproof team. So you got to know your strengths, you got to know your weaknesses. So there is a, um, there is a concept that uh, the person should develop their strong sides, not weak sides, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. he should uh, pay more attention on strong sides and weak sides, not weak sides. What's, what's your opinion on that? Is it true? I think it's a balancing act. You know, once you know, you know, I can spend the two, next two years trying to improve my operational detail, efficiency, project management thingies, yeah, I probably can figure this out and do a good job, but why? It's boring to me. But the other people... It's not yours. Work. It's why? not my thing. Yeah. So question yeah. is, why not know that, admit it, and find people who love doing that? So I have people in my team who are great at operational details, but you know, for them to be able to connect the dot, paint a vision, inspire people is not their thing. So this is why you every successful startup you see, there are two or three or sometimes four co-founders. Okay, the practical question, if for, for instance I would like to set up my own business, mm -hmm. I have the idea, so I found a niche, how practically I can assemble this team of co-founders, where can I look for them? I had a look at my classmates, I have not seen, mm -hmm. I see no one there. I had a look at my friends, also no people. So what can, what can be done by the entrepreneur in this case? Uh, for instance, uh, I read some book and I see that, uh, okay, it's good to have uh, three or four co-founders with the different uh, mm -hmm. skill sets, but where, where shall I find them? Well, let me ask you this question. When you decide it's time to have a girlfriend, where do you find her? What did, what did you do? I start with thinking about it. Exactly. Right? I think about it, which places she can be. Yeah. Then what maybe attributes she should have. I talk about this. Yes. yes I talk about yes. this to my to your friends. To your friends. And somebody uh, say, you know, you know that I know this girl over there, maybe when I meet her. Exactly. Yeah. Same I pay method. my attention. Same method. There's no I difference. See. Every time you raise a confusion, what entrepreneurs should do, ask yourself what happens in dating. 100% of the time is the same answer. I see. Yeah, that's great advice, you see. <laughs> You see, uh, if you uh, came to the stage that you organized a startup, mm -hmm. right? And uh, your money generates some profit, you have some team, and the company is working, say, two, three years, mm -hmm. uh, five years, but at some local level. So how the company can uh, make this transition or breakthrough from the startup to scale up? Well, just like anything else, you, you start in a small area to fix out the kinks in your method. The product will have deficiency. How will you support it? How will uh, you improve it? You work with the first three, four, ten customers to polish the product. Once you do that, then the time is to how can you take it to other cities, other countries, other regions. So it's the normal scaling process. Once we have perfected, you have at least a handful of successful users, then you hire people in other region. You do some research. Where are the more customers? Which city? Which country? You start by hiring one employee or one consultant in that in country. Does it teach us locally? How should it do? So I'm in Ukraine now, and I'm trying to talk to, I have identified two people already, but in my, in my last four days, who could be my representative in this country? And both of them are Great. open to the idea. 
and they both have different skills. So when I'm deciding to enter Ukraine formally, Eastern Europe, which I plan to do next year, I'm going to start working with one of them mm -hmm. in the next couple of months to identify the companies, translate into a local language, find distributors. So it's going to take about three to four months to identify those people. So in six months, we'll be ready to start selling. So you do the same thing. I'm going to, I was in Australia last week doing the same thing. Identified one person who could be a representative. I'm probably going to Argentina next month. So this is a normal process. You find with finding a one friend, mm -hmm. one employee you can trust, and you use their help to start building the organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So point is, don't do it prematurely. If things are not working in one city, in your home place, when you have unfair advantage, no sense trying to duplicate it 10 times. You're just multiplying your problems 10 times. Mm -hmm. So you need to get everything working in some laboratory in a city, then you scale. Mm -hmm. So when McDonald launches a new product, a new burger, they don't launch worldwide. They launch in one city in Kansas, mm -hmm. middle of nowhere, because if it doesn't work out, nobody knows no harm done. Uh, I could see the cases mm -hmm. when the founder, for instance, the founder started the company and uh, later on he is a CEO, mm -hmm. but he is not uh, an effective CEO. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually those people who founded the company cannot be an effective CEO. Mm -hmm. You see, we can see it. Um, and uh, you see, I know this news that uh, you, you probably also know that um, Travis Kalanick, the mm -hmm. founder of Uber, uh, Uber yeah. and the CEO of Uber, yeah. so this is like the largest technological company in the world. Mm -hmm. And recently he was fired by the board of directors mm -hmm. uh, and he stepped out from mm -hmm. the uh, CEO role. Yeah. Um, so in your opinion, can the CEO, can the founder who, who started the company become in effect an effective CEO or it's an in, in illusion and the, and the founder should hire the CEO later well, on? It depends. So, you know, nobody comes out of their mother's womb ready to be a CEO. So even the best CEOs learned. Jack Welch was not a great CEO when he was five years old. So how did he become a great CEO? Well. Is he learned on the job, learned how to be effective, develop his own techniques. So the question is, some people have the ability to transform and learn. Some people find it boring. CEO's job is much worse than you think, especially startup CEO job. You're doing all the things nobody wants to do true, because you have nobody true. else. So it's not as glamorous. So you're really good at programming and you're a computer architect and you're a CEO. What do you do most of the day? Architecture? Coding? No. You're trying to arrange the payroll, you're talking to an accounting firm, you're trying to file for the patent, you're trying to interview some people, you're solving some problem because somebody spilled the water in the lab. When do you do coding? After dinner. So is that a fun way to live? If you're a great coder and architect? Most people say no, who wants that? So you have to know what you really enjoy. So if you look at uh, in Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg brought in Sheryl Sandberg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Sheryl really is running the company day to day. Zuckerberg is the CEO, but he's a great product guy. He's a great visionary. But he is lucky. He's lucky to find uh, well, Sheryl. But that's what it is. The smart CEOs found people. Mm -hmm. They become lucky because they try. So look at Bill Gates or look at Larry Ellison at Oracle. They have stayed CEO for the last 30 years. Why? Because they were able to compensate for their weakness by finding other members and motivating them and giving them incentives. So sometime, even with you know, Kalanick who got fired, but he didn't get fired from his ownership. He still owns the same number of shares. Yeah, he stayed in the board of board, the And maybe the, I think even leaving the board. The point is that don't confuse control from ownership. They're two different things. You may not be the CEO, but you're still a shareholder. And that frees you up to do other things you want to do in life. So idea is that Either find yourself, are you able to learn and step up to the role, understand the role, know your weakness, and either compensate for them by replacing yourself or finding other team members who can compensate for your weakness. If you don't do any of the above, you deserve to be fired. In this case, uh, in this uh, super fast time of change and innovation and all these uh, things that happen in the world, 
Mm, in your opinion, uh, say for Ukrainian business owners or entrepreneurs, what uh, traits uh, should the CEO or founders develop to stay competitive uh, in the five, ten years' time? I think it comes down to two things. One, you need to have a strategic view. You have to read, observe, listen to where is the technology going. So think it's a complex game. Your customers are moving here. Your competitors are moving here. And new technologies are coming here. You have to have to be able to connect the dots. Not everybody is good at connecting the dots. You're seeing three things happening, and you have to estimate, OK, if competition is going this way, trends are this way, customers are going here, what do I need to deliver which will satisfy them? That's strategic thinking and strategic planning. This requires thinking, listening, observing, and connecting the dot. Most people don't do that. They're too busy running day-to-day -day stuff, emails, meetings. Who's going to connect the dot? So this is a very important function. You have to walk away from your day-to-day -day business to be able to connect the dot. Second thing is you have to develop the talent. You can connect all the dot in the world, but if you don't have people who can execute, you got nothing. How do you develop people? Why would smart people will come work for you? You have to ask that question. A smart person can make a money and do good things anywhere. Why would or start their own business. Start their own business. If they are smart enough. Uh... Well, it's not being smart enough. If, if they are willing to put up with the misery of starting <clears throat> a business, that's more accurate. Yes, so you have to develop and invest in people. So one of the things Jack Welch, the CEO of General Electric, ex-CEO, writes in his book that who is the most important person on executive staff? Most companies will say chief financial officer. And he said no. Is the human resource, head of human resource, the most important person. So he elevated that position to that level. And today, many of the people who are in his executive staff are CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. So he created almost a factory of process, of leadership. So one of my favorite books to read, to understand this better, is by Larry Bossidy, who was uh, chairman CEO of Allied Signal and Honeywell. I think he was one of the people who worked for GE and Jack Welch. So book is called Execution. Easy to remember, Execution, great book. So it really puts all those principles how to run a company in as one single volume. What's the main idea of the book that you took from, from it? That is about discipline. It's about discipline of grooming your people, discipline of creating a culture of accountability, and monthly, weekly meetings, reporting, so all dots, people feel responsible and accountable and give your people enough objective and say, you tell me how you're going to go there. You founded the company in when you were 26. Yeah, the first one, yeah. yeah the first one, uh, when you were 26. After that, you worked uh, or started uh, seven companies. Uh, one of them was uh, uh, sold to Oracle. So you have a huge experience on this uh, startups, entrepreneurship, and you went through all this past, like doing, uh, doing yourself, all yeah. this stuff. What were your main like, failures or mistakes uh, during this uh, time period that you could share? Well, there are many mistakes and many failures. Uh, Maybe the biggest ones. The biggest one is hiring the wrong people, because it's very hard to assemble the right team which executes well together. Having the right team requires trust and work ethic and purpose. And you, you know, sometimes people fool you, especially salespeople. So you end up hiring the wrong salesperson. Or you're so desperate to fill a spot that you compromise and say, this is good enough. And then you pay the price. So. Can, you, can you tell the biggest mistakes of some executive that you hired and then there was a disaster? Well, it's not some one big mistake. It's your own mistake. For example, in my company, Britzer Mobile, I really wanted to hire and had a pressure from the board, a VP of sales. And, you know, I looked and looked and there was, wasn't the right person. So I ended up hiring a guy named Alan, who was a good guy, but he was really good guy at setting up a distributors and a channel partners. And he even told me, look, I may be the wrong guy because, you know, I don't do direct sales because we, our job was to do this million dollar sales to big companies. It's mobile security product. But I said, you know, you have done sales. You were a guy who can attract other people. So yeah, you don't have the channel. You have, you're a channel guy, but maybe you can do direct sales. How hard could it be? I was wrong. 
is a completely different what happened? So he, he could not really sell. He hired lots of people, spent a lot of money. He could never get a customer. So all the sales I did was I, did, I made the sales of direct customers. So how do you value the losses that you had in, in financial? Uh... It probably cost me, I think, uh, $50 million in the valuation of the company when the company was sold. That's a lot. The company was sold for this price, could have been sold for this price if we had 10 more customers. So one person yeah. at, the right, uh, at the right role yeah. could cost company $50 million. Yeah. Dollars. Yeah. Uh, in my case, could be even more for something else. So you know, Elon Musk, for example, uh, autonomous vehicle, he's gone through, I think, four or seven people for head of auton autonomous car project in the last two or three years. So he keeps firing and hiring the other person, and they're falling behind an autonomous vehicle project because you know we haven't been able, he hasn't not been able to find the right person which he can work with so you mean he he changed uh, six or seven uh, people uh, he fired like, them uh, hired fired. a new one fired them new, the head of autonomous vehicle project has been replaced multiple times so it means those people were not suitable for some we don't know some i don't know the reason what but it, <clears throat> whatever the reason was the people were not suitable he was not suitable the project was not suitable there was a chemistry issue there was a some other issue i don't know the reasons but mm. point is that biggest mistake startups make is usually that. Second mistake people make is not understanding the, the, the customer need. And they think this is the problem and customer really wants that. Customers are not always able to tell you what they want. Mm -hmm. You have to triangulate, you have to estimate, you have to connect the dot. Because most people tell them what you want, they don't, they can tell you, hey, I want an iPhone. You know, when, you, you know, when Henry Ford asks people, what do you want? He wants the faster horse. So mm -hmm. people can only relate what they do. So you have to be able to connect the dots. Then, of course, the third mistake people make is not studying the computation. And I've made that mistake more than once. In my enthusiasm... Do you think we need to start to, learn, to, to know the competitors well? Yes, very mm -hmm. much so. You know, I'm, sometimes I start the company in this company, I'm finding competitors which I did, should have known, I did not know. So understanding the competition and who they are and what are they trying to do is extremely important. During your, uh, this uh, working years, uh, what would be your biggest regret that you actually did and you regret it? Well, uh, you know, w one of the mistakes I made was the, in the last company, I had one investor, one main investor. And that is not a good idea. Why is that? Because the one investor you need a balance on the board. You need two or three equal weight investor. Otherwise, it becomes like a dictator. Just like in parliament, if you have one party with 90% of the vote, mm -hmm. outcome is very different than you have three parties or two parties. With about, you have to negotiate and make better decisions. You have to debate them. So if you have one investor, when he goes left, you have no choice but to go left. But if you have two or three people on the board of equal weight, then they say, well, why not right? Should we have to go west? And then you have a balanced view and a better decisions are made. So my advice to myself is never take a one single investor, try to look for a balance on the board and the control. So but what is the number of uh, investors? Two or three, uh, two, two or three. three. Two or three. Because then a healthy debate can emerge. It's the same answer. How many parties should there be in the parliament and if you're like Italy, and nobody has majority in their 20 parties, no good comes out of it. If like, you know, America, there are two main parties, so there's some of a balance there. So there's some number like two or three is a good balance for main investors. Sometimes there is a situation for CEO that CEO feels uh, like, uh, feels dis depressed or um, feels uh, not good, like you see. And it's not HR, it's not CFO, it's a number one person. And uh, he is, there is no one he can go with his problems, actually, because he, he doesn't want to uh, sound weak or something like this. So that's, that's the problem the CEO can encounter for some reasons. Uh, did you have this kind of situation, and what did you do? So all the time. CEO's job is very lonely. Uh, just like you said, you can't complain to your board because the only thing they know is to replace you. You can't complain to your That's people. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And because they, they expect you to be leading. If you're confused and depressed, then they will be. You can't talk to your wife or husband because they always tell you, I told you you were no good at this. Why are you doing this? So you have to find some way. So there are a couple of things I've done. 
I've uh, formed a, a club of CEOs, round mm. table. When CEOs are five or six CEOs, they meet once a month for lunch or dinner, and they discuss and advise each other. I found that to be very useful. Interesting. I did Good that idea. for four or five years. I need, they, those people all gone away now, so we haven't done it, but it was very useful. And I've also, their professional organization who such do something like that, a circle of CEOs, a 10, 12 CEO, but they charge you money. But I, I did it myself, I don't need a circle. I've also had a coach, CEO coach. And the second thing you said, you're working with your coach, with a, with a like corporate coach? or Yeah, this is usually an individual. And not right now, I don't have a coach. If you could share just a just couple, what were the, the deep questions that you worked with your coach uh, many years before? So there are questions like how to deal with personnel issues or hiring a right vice president or conflict in your team, how to resolve it, or what should be your priority in the next one year. Could be this, this, or this. Which one will lead to a better outcome? How to deal with your investors? How to approach some situation in a way which is delicate. There are dozens of situations every week a CEO deals with. And you could be experienced CEO and you can make six out of 10 decisions correctly, but there'll always be four which you did not make them as well. So CEO's job is to take that percent from 60% good decision to 80% good decision. You're still gonna make mistakes, but hopefully fewer. My next question would be, um, uh, you, you are the professor hmm. or in the uh, University of California, so you teach the students, the MBA students, but how do you teach yourself? How do you develop yourself, uh, yeah. if you could tell? So a lot of that is, uh, is connecting the dot by listening, by reading, by talking. So first you learn from your students quite a bit too, because they all have different perspectives. But you know, when I'm driving, or I'm in an airplane, I'm listening to an audio book. So every year I publish in my LinkedIn all the books I read this year and what, what was the impact. And I typically go through about 20 books a year. You return 20 books a year? So typically, sometimes 15, sometimes 25, but you know, on average 20 books a year. I'm always reading two, three books simultaneously. And they're not all business books. They're, you know, there's a combination of books, history, biography, business. And you learn something, not, you know, like last year I, I read the biography of Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla, as well as uh, several other book business about uh, the world in the next 100 years, the geopolitics, and uh, why Ukraine should be happy about its future, but not short term. So, you know, there are other kind of things. So it's all about, the point I'm making is, it may be more subtle. Why would people talk to you? Why would people engage with you? You have to be interesting. Are you interesting? What makes you interesting? Okay, it's hard to be interesting. It takes a lot of investment to be interesting. But if you're not interesting, are you at least interested? Most people are neither interesting nor interested. To me, those people are a waste of time. I, after every conversation, every dinner party, I ask my wife, what did we learn? She, had, she doesn't like this question. <laughs> But she said, right. you can't judge like this. But yeah, I'm judging like this. What did I learn? If I learned nothing from this person, why do I want to spend more time with this person? It may be ruthless, but in my mind, my most precious commodity is time. I have to use my time effectively. If I'm not learning, if something is not interesting or not educating, if I'm not being interesting, then let, let me do something else. So what are your hobbies? Um, what are the things that inspire you? I think, you know, the life at global level is beautiful. Oh, we are living tell, tell more about this. Life at global level, this sounds great. Yeah, because you know, your local, on your street, maybe bad things are going on, but you have to lift your nose above that. If you look at the whole world in general, great things are going on. The overall, the human ability to live longer, to be more productive thing, to have a global reach has never been higher than it is right now. There's so many technological innovation happening, which is going to impact our lives, which is very, very positive. There's so much to be optimistic about. I mean, I couldn't be more excited to be alive right now. Things like artificial intelligence is aiding people to do better diagnostics in medical. Computers who are aiding the doctors to diagnose the disease better. Able to do 
some complex procedures using robots, which we couldn't do before, able to create objects, able to ship things, able to move goods, able to access cuisines from all over the world in a way, our, our whole life is simplified with all the gadgets if used correctly. There's much to be excited about. Sure, there are 20 things to be depressed about, but there are about 40 things to be excited about. So it's positive, uh, positive mindset. Uh, yeah, it's not even just... positive mindset. Like, come on, lift your, have a global perspective. Sure, you could focus on the 20 things which are wrong and complain all day. But what good comes out of that? Nothing. Exactly. <laughs> Nothing. So, you know, one of the great line in the movie, which I really love and repeat, and I forget the name of the movie, but it's the, I think it was the German spy or Soviet spy uh, undercover. If the movie was just out uh, a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and the spy w was a very cool guy and said, don't you want to shout, complain? He said, would it help? And that was his whole perspective in life. Would it help? And answer is no. Then why do it? Yeah, no, no sense. Yeah, no, no sense. sense. No sense. Uh, what makes you happy? Every morning, getting up. I'm still alive and I'm living in the, one of the best planets, maybe one of, one of the best places on the planet, with the people who are meaningful to me and opportunities which are limitless. Anything is possible. I grew up in Pakistan with a lower middle class family with no necessarily opportunity to do anything great, but through focus, through guidance from people around me, was able to find my way into Silicon Valley, becoming an electrical engineer, getting degrees from advanced Ivy League education, able to start companies, able to make some money and impact lives. What is not to be excited about? This is excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great. So thank you so much uh, for being with us uh, today and I wish you all the success with your current startup, with your company and also with the partners in Ukraine. And I hope to see you also soon uh, in Ukraine again. Indeed. Thank you. Yeah. Good to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.